So let's talk. Wujun Dinaway Maganitok, Wabanaku Nigo, Kwekwe Kibinas Minoa, Wazao Vitang, Indigenous Kaz, Pujun Do with them, Kakagi Wat the Sonega Ming and Doonji, the Chi Bai Mateo, Abachin Ji Kandam, Nongum, Nemiguachu Yen Gail, Gi Anami Yen, Nemiguachu Yen Gain in Jeanette, Kigi Widoka Wiak, and Shinabe Quake. Apache, uh, Apache me watching the kit. Oh, uh, Kagin, uh, Oshki and Niniak, uh, Oshki a quay work, uh, Nigichi and Ninamin. Winge, winge. So, uh, I just want to open up like that and conclude my remarks like that. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm just giving time for the translators to catch up to what I was saying there. Puis, je suis vraiment fier d'être ici avec vous aujourd'hui. So what I say uh, in French and uh, our first founding language of Ojibwe is uh, good morning to you all. My name is uh, Wab Kanu. Wab is short for Wabanaquit, which means gray cloud in Ojibwe. But it was quickly shortened to Wab when I started playing hockey because nobody wanted to yell, hey, pass me the puck, Wabanaquit. <laughs> you know, growing up in, uh, in Canada, I was afforded a lot of opportunities I'm very grateful for those things. And yet there was challenges as well. There was a lot of challenges being, uh, in many instances, the only Aboriginal kid in the school or the only Aboriginal kid on the hockey team. And yet it sort of put me in a unique position where I was able to observe the differences between the two cultures and see how, even though we're very much the same and we have the same wants and needs and visions, we also have those cultural differences. And uh, I think nowhere are they more apparent than when it comes to dating, mating, and relating. <laughs> like, you think about it, like, the non-native person, when they see somebody that they like, what do they do? They date, you know? And then if the dating goes well, then what happens? They move in together, right? And then if that goes well, they get married. And then after that, it's a big step, which is? They get a dog. <laughs> and if the dog survives for a couple years, well, then they have kids. <laughs> Aboriginal people, on the other hand, were different, right? When we see somebody we like, what do we do? Snag. <laughs> and then what's next? You have kids. <laughs> and then you move in together. And if you can still stand each other after 10 years, then you get married. I kid, I kid, I joke, I joke. But the lesson that we are very much the same people, notwithstanding our differences, is, is one that I want to talk to you guys about today. Specifically, I want to talk about inclusion and innovation, as I think there's uh, some lessons that I've visited in my own career that might benefit some of the people here today. So the clip that we watched before I came up here was from a television series that the CBC did earlier this year called The Eighth Fire. And I'm just going to tell you guys a little bit about the series uh, by way of background. The tone we struck in that two-minute excerpt was pretty much uh, typical of the whole series, you know, more casual, more approachable, a look at the challenges, but also a look at the reality, a more honest, a more complete picture of the Aboriginal community than the one that you usually see on the 6 o'clock news on different outlets across our country. And people really responded to it. I believe that there's a huge appetite, a huge hunger in our country to see the Aboriginal community for what it really is, not just amongst Aboriginal peoples. Don't get me wrong, Aboriginal people are sick and tired of the stereotypes, are sick and tired of the oversimplified stories, absolutely. But so are non-Native people. Non-Native people thirst and have a hunger to hear the true state of our country. And so that's what we tried to present with Eighth Fire. The name itself comes from uh, an Anishinaabe prophecy. We, we, we use the teachings in particular of, a, of an elder named William Commanda, who no doubt many of you guys are familiar with. But just to recap, what Elder Commanda said is that after contact between Aboriginal people and uh, the non-Native people, that there would be seven generations or seven fires of conflict, turmoil, and all around bad times. 
But then after that, there would be an eighth fire, an eighth generation that would come along and create a new relationship, build a new fire of harmony, peace, friendship, and understanding. Now, I'm not sure how many of you guys believe in things like prophecies or what have you, or the traditional teachings of the Anishinaabe. That's fine. But if you look around at Canada, about 140 years after most of the numbered treaties were signed, I think that that prophecy is a powerful metaphor, a powerful allegory to think about the way things are unfolding today. The old view that the wants, needs, and visions of Aboriginal people and those of the rest of Canada being mutually exclusive are coming to a close. And there's a new relationship emerging, one that recognizes that we have more in common than we do have different. And fundamentally, that we do better when we work together. So in the series, we profiled that in a number of ways. We spoke to the doctors, the lawyers. We spoke to the business people, the artists. And there was tons of powerful stories that emerged, one of them from Inclusion Works 2011, where a young uh, graduate came and uh, was offered a job by one of the banks. And uh, in her words, she put it uh, quite uh, eloquently that uh, education is the new buffalo, meaning that education is the vehicle that will provide the Aboriginal community with its housing, food, tools, and sustenance for the current generation. We traveled around the country. We spoke to other people. We went to Saskatchewan, and we met John Lajemodier, a Métis man who runs cultural awareness training for miners, for steelworkers, for farmers. And he brought in two very racist people into his workshops, people whose ideas of uh, Aboriginal people had more to do with dependency and being a nuisance than they did with the true role that Anishinaabe people have occupied throughout our history. And yet, in sitting with these two men and walking them through the history of our country, pointing out the inequitable laws that existed here, and by asking them some challenging questions about where they come, came from, over the course of the 44 minutes of that episode, we saw attitudes change. We saw these two men change their way of thinking recognize a little bit of the history that got us to where we are today because, my friends, my relatives, nothing happens in a vacuum. And so there's often questions about why do we need to honor treaties? Why do we need to work towards inclusion? And it is because our, Can our, our country of Canada has a history, and it's one that is challenging when it comes to Aboriginal people. And so together, we need to find ways to work towards a brighter tomorrow. One of the other communities that I was really heartened to visit recently and that I really wish we could have profiled in Eighth Fire is a community close to Sudbury, Ontario called the Sagamok Anishinaabeg. Now these people are really showing what it means to create a new relationship, not just within our borders. They're doing interesting things here. You know, they're ISO 9001 certified and they're going out and they're passing that designation on to other communities which is very laudable, and it's a very commendable goal in and of itself. But they're also building partnerships with the private sector. Right now they're in talks with Chevrolet to develop a pickup truck that would have an Ojibwe name, and that would be uh, marketed to all the rural, northern, and aboriginal communities across Canada. It's a huge market, tens of thousands of vehicles every year. But that's not the most impressive thing that they're doing. While I was visiting their community, there was an emissary of the Chinese government there. And he's not the first one. They've hosted Chinese ministers at their community hunting and, uh, and fishing retreats. And what they've done is actually set up a China desk in their community that is building business relationships with China. All of the business people in the room know that that's where Canada's exports are planned to go in the future. So what they've done is set up a relationship where they're going to export natural resources from their traditional territory, and they're going to import textiles and other manufactured goods and act as a distributor, a wholesaler, here in Canada. 
One of their target clients is the Northwest Company. So for several hundred years, the Northwest Company has had a relationship where they go into Aboriginal communities and sell goods to the people, particularly in those northern and remote communities. Well, as Sagamok Anishinaabek plans unfold, the relationship will change. There will now be an Aboriginal middleman in that equation. It's a really impressive community. A lot of interesting things happening there, and it's being driven by their own band members, not by outside consultants, not by co-managers or third-party managers. Yeah. It's communities like that that are leading the change in our country, that are the cutting edge. And there's many people in this room that are doing the same thing. I was very heartened to meet a lot of uh, interesting prospective employers last night, and also a lot of talented and intelligent grads. I, I met one young man who had 10 job interviews yesterday. Brent, do you want give to give us a wave there? I can't even meet 10 people in a day and remember those interactions. Never mind conduct myself through 10 job interviews. It's very impressive. So this message seems to, it seems to resonate as I travel around the country. I think people are, 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 are hungry to, change, to turn the page on the relationship, and there's many people doing exciting things. But uh, what I want to talk to you about today is a little bit about how I got to the place where I could you know, kind of present that message to Canada. The first story is how I got my foot in the door at CBC, and the second one is how I kept it within the CBC's building. So I'll just run through the first one quickly because most of you guys heard uh, some of my remarks yesterday. Essentially, I went to school to study economics. I left university, and I started working contract jobs, casual jobs, temp jobs, construction, work today, pay today, all sorts of different things. After a few years of that, by happenstance, I wrote a letter to the editor of the Winnipeg Free Press, the daily uh, independent newspaper in Winnipeg, uh, about Team Canada hockey, of all things. They published it. Somebody at the CBC thought that was a novel point of view. They looked me up in the phone book. They called me up, and they said, hey, do you want to turn that into something for the radio? So I said, sure. So then I came down to the CBC sat in on a story meeting, pitched some ideas. They invited me to work, in, work with them for a week. A week became a month. A month became a year. Six years later, here I am. I worked my way up from intern in the newsroom to producer on the radio to radio host to TV journalist to television host. And so it's been quite, a, quite an interesting ride. I've been afforded tons of great opportunities, both within and without the, cor without the corporation, to... Uh, enhance my knowledge, and I think most of all, um, I've tried to hit a home run every time they, they throw the, the ball at me. I don't always hit a home run, but uh, when I miss, I swing spectacularly and fail. <laughs> I strike out big time. The story that I want to talk to you guys about today, though, that I think offers lessons around inclusion and innovation is one that happened in 2008. Now, who here remembers the apology? See, I don't even need to explain. I just say the apology. It was, it was quite significant, right? Like, rarely in your life do you see history about to happen. So the government of Canada made the decision to apologize to the survivors of Indian residential schools. And they announced a date, and so we were able to plan coverage of this historic event. It's going to be in June 2008. And we built all sorts of initiatives, programming initiatives for television, radio, internet, community outreach initiatives where we'd go out and bring residential school survivors together to watch the apology, to offer their stories, to offer their reaction. One of the events that I uh, programmed in Winnipeg was at the site of a, or not in Winnipeg, but in Manitoba, at Portage La Prairie, Manitoba, was at the site of a former residential school. And uh, we invited a, a musician who's a residential school survivor, Billy Joe Green. We, we invited a second generation descendant and a third generation descendant uh, musicians to come and share their gifts and to write a song 
We commissioned each of them to write a song commemorating the equation or the, uh, the occasion. Billy Joe Green in particular was adamantly opposed to participating. He was a man who was taken away from his family very painfully as a little boy, suffered greatly in the years that followed after he left residential school, and his attitude towards the apology was, no, I don't want an apology, I want charges. And I want it to be resolved in the criminal justice system. Statute of limitations being what it is, other challenges notwithstanding, I talked to him, I said, you know what? I respect your, 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 your point of view, I respect your account of what happened. I'm not asking you to change that, but I am asking you to come and participate and share your point of view as part of the events that we're organizing. And so I won him over. I vouched for the CBC in my community and got buy-in. About a week before the apology came down, there was an internal missive. Now, for those of you uh, from outside the corporation, which is everybody except for one in the room, I believe, there is an internal body of the, the top journalists at CBC that sets the editorial standards, that sets the journalistic policy for our organization. And a week before the apology, they set out a memo to everybody saying, we know that the people who went to residential schools like to refer to themselves as survivors. While that is nice, it is technically inaccurate. And we want you, in all coverage of the residential school story, to refer to them as former students. And so, I tripped out. <laughs> There's no simple way of saying that. It's a, it's a very personal issue for me. I am the first generation in my family that did not go to residential schools. You know, my older cousins went to residential school. I watched the devastation that it wrought in our communities. I watched the devastation that it wrought in my family as we buried loved ones to addiction and to suicide as I was growing up. I heard the stories of the abuses that my father suffered, my aunt, my uncles, all these things. And so for me, my first reaction was anger but then I composed myself and I set about writing a letter to the journalists explaining why they were wrong. So they offered a definition from the Webster's Dictionary of Survivor that is a person, plant, or animal that outlasts others of its kind who perish in a disaster. So I said, listen, there's, there's two conditions in that definition. The first is person, plant, or animal. Well, I think the first one is satisfied, people. Hopefully we're all on the same page about that, because it used to be up for debate in Canada. The second is the perishing in a disaster, outlasting others of its kind. And I said, Stephen Harper would not be apologizing if this was not a disaster. Tens of thousands of Aboriginal children lost their lives in these schools and never went home. The expressed intent of these schools was to kill the Indian in the child. It sounds like the conditions are satisfied to me. So I wrote the letter. Those of you guys who heard me yesterday know that I'm pretty fond of writing letters. <laughs> and then I like brushed my hands and I was like, all right, let's get on with it. But it wasn't that simple. They called me back and they said, listen, Wop, thanks, but, but no thanks. You're wrong. And I said, all right. I know I'm not wrong. I'm going to quit. If you don't change the policy, I stake my career on, uh, on that decision. And uh, from there, it kicked into, into gear a whole bunch of internal politicking. Managers, regional directors, executives, journalists. A bunch of people started meeting behind the scenes. There was a bunch of activity. There was a bunch of emails, a bunch more memos, a bunch more consultations of, Web of the Webster's Dictionary. And then a week later, the day of the apology, no, the day before the apology, sorry, they convened a conference call with the senior journalists and the uh, Aboriginal journalists from across the country, as well as some of those other interested parties, to discuss the issue and to resolve it. And then I was thinking to myself, like, damn, I painted myself into a corner here, because I'm pretty sure nobody else thinks this is as important as I do. So I'm, I'm just going to have to resign. But then we went on the call, 
Everybody around the horn. It's got to be survivor. 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 Full credit to the senior journalists at the CBC. They recognized the mistake that they had made, and they changed the policy. Now every time when I watch The National or I hear CBC radio and I hear a journalist use the term residential school survivor on the air, I give myself one of these. <laughs> but it's not so much giving myself one of these as it is, you know, having done one for the team, so to speak. If I was staking my career on an issue of personal benefit, I don't think I would have been successful. If I was doing something without the support of my community, I don't think I would have been successful. I took that issue in that week of internal politicking to the uh, Chiefs of Ontario, to the Grand Council of Treaty 3, to the residential school survivors in my life, and I discussed it with them. And they all said, it's a good thing that you're doing this. So I knew that it was the right thing to do, and I didn't really worry too much about how it would be resolved in the end after I knew that my people were on side. I was a little apprehensive about, you know, looking for work, but it is what it is. So I think there's a few lessons in there. The biggest one, and the one that was most meaningful to me, is that at that moment in 2008, I confronted the central question of diversity and inclusion. And that is, namely, am I there to be a token? Am I there to fill out some sort of quota? Or am I there as a meaningful part of the organization? Am I truly being included as a contributing partner in the future of this corporation? And while there was kicking and screaming involved, I'm happy to say that the CBC told me with its actions that I am a meaningful part of the organization, that I can help steer the ship into the future. And so as we sit here and think about inclusion or diversity, that is the question. Are we here to fill out a quota? Are we here to put a line into a prospectus about reaching out to the Aboriginal community? Or are we here to help bring about meaningful change. And not just meaningful change for the so sake of big social ideals or to rectify past wrongs, but meaningful change in the name of competitive advantage. And uh, I'll explain what I mean by that. The CBC has a mandate to be the Canada's public broadcaster, to put it simply. If it doesn't represent Canada's public, then it's not fulfilling its mandate. If it's not representative of all Canadians, including Aboriginal Canadians, then it's not doing its job. So by changing its internal structure to help accommodate the Aboriginal worldview, I helped nudge the CBC closer to fulfilling its mandate. That exercise there brought it closer in line with its corporate goals. And it didn't happen through strategy, it happened by happenstance. But when we look around the world that we are in today, we know that the companies that succeed are, are, are the ones that are agile, the ones that are nimble. 1970s, who are the technology leaders? Xerox, Polaroid. Where are those companies today? Xerox allowed their probably second biggest innovation to be taken away by Apple Computer, and now Apple Computer is a huge corporate behemoth, one of the most valuable companies of all time, if not the most valuable of all time. IBM, on the other hand, a little bit more nimble. You know, they watched the evolution and went from server provider to personal computer provider to now service solutions provider. Companies that bring in people with different points of view, different experiences, by definition, are going to be the more nimble, the more agile, the more reactive companies. If you have 100 people in a room who all say that and think the same thing, how are you going to find that outside-of-the-box solution? 
if you bring in people who have a different life experience, who spoke a different language, who visited a different experience in this great country of ours, Canada, then you're inviting other solutions to the table. You're opening the doors of your organization to be more expansive and to be more welcoming of change. And as we look around the business world of today and we hear how important cult culture is within companies, we hear how important it is to, uh, to find the innovative solutions, well, then the picture starts to crystallize that perhaps inclusion is about more than just ticking a box, but rather it is a strategic investment today that will pay dividends in the name of innovation tomorrow. So, I invite you guys to spend your time here making that investment into the future of your companies, to seek out the in-demand students who will bring the solutions that will help guide your companies, your corporations, your organizations towards a brighter tomorrow. And again, we all do better when we work together. Thank you guys for listening to me.